is call it observation. Maharshi preferred the word inquiry. And I, struggling with these statements, have come to the understanding. My personal understanding is to call this observing our own egoistic thought or calling it inquiring, how did this arise, what is this, who am I, are just difference in language. Observation and inquiry are one. There was a stage when I used to feel observation, that is watching my own ego very hurt or increased, and inquiry are two sides of the same coin. Then I said, why call them two sides of the same coin? They are one. There is no coin here and no two sides. See, when you use the idiomatic expression, two sides of the same coin, there are two things which go together. When this is here, that also is here. When, that is, when A is there, B also is there. When B is there, A also is there. That is called two sides of the same coin. But there are no A and B. Alert, observation, necessarily inquires. And inquiry necessarily has observation as part of it. So let's stick to the word inquiry, which is Ramana's language. Chinvataha. Ai is an exclamation. No. The ahankara collapses, vanishes. Therefore, this Atma Vichara is called Mule Kutharaha. You take an axe and rather than cutting a branch here or cutting a shoot over there, put the axe to the very base of the tree. In the example, sorry for the violent example, if some of you think you know, this is, you know, it's an example. Cut the axe, cut the uh, tree by putting the axe to the very base, the whole tree at one go. Likewise, inquire, who am I? Who is hurt? Who is feeling lost? Who is feeling alone or lonely? Who feels let down by everybody? Who feels one is a sinner? Who feels one is a punyatma? Question it all. Mind becomes quieter. Otherwise, the mind would have given more and more support to whatever label you had put on yourself, confirming and strengthening it. Patati aham, and this indeed is nija. Nija means swa, oneself. This is self-inquiry. Now, the fourth and last shloka we will see quickly to complete this portion. This whole science will come again and again in the last ten verses too. But these four verses, as I said in the beginning, are the crux of the entire Upadesha Sara. The twentieth verse answers a question. If our ego dies, because it is an ahankara hapatati, then how do we live? Without ego, is it possible to walk on the earth? It says, first of all, you know, ego is not the functional mind. It is the psychological dimension. You know, yesterday in some context I had said, if you love tea before enlightenment, you will continue to love tea. Because you are enlightened, you won't change, you know. Suddenly from tea, you won't go to coffee. If you knew Gujarati very well before enlightenment, after enlightenment, you would not start speaking Marathi. <laughs> Those are all functional part. Therefore, Vyavahara, transaction, not only dealing with driving or other machines, etc., you're dealing with this spouse, children, etc., will be like ever before. But the difference is, earlier you used to be judgmental of others and judgmental of yourself, and therefore feeling low or high about yourself, and putting labels of he is good, she is bad, etc. about others, that all will go away. A cartoon came to me yesterday over media. One Babaji is uh, at some office. It appears he has come for an interview with a long beard and some long gown, a very peaceful looking, bald. The interviewing person over there, the other end says, looking at the biodata, <laughs> and says, Oh, oh, I see. It's nice to know, nice to know you are enlightened. Uh, but apart from enlightenment, do you have any other qualification? 
very nicely made, you know, how the cartoons they show. Enlightened man also is perplexed. I have enlightenment, I don't know anything else, but I want a job. That fellow also is naive and innocent. He respects the enlightenment. It's nice to know. But our company requires, you know, you know, at least some technical, administrative, accounting, finance, cooking, or janitor's work, or something you should know. Apart from enlightenment, do you have any other qualification? But if, respectfully he asks, the picture, you know, is very nice. Anyway, uh, all of us have some skills, and none of them goes away. Anyhow, technically it's answered. Ahami nasha bhajjaha mahantaya Ahami nasha bhajjaha mahantaya Spurati hrat swayam parama purna sat Spurati hrat swayam parama purna sat Ahami nasha bhajjaha mahantaya Ahami nasha bhajjaha Purati Hrit Swayam Parama Purna Sat Purati Hrit Swayam Parama Purna Sat That limited I, which is called Aham, which means Ahankara, when it dies, Ahami Nasha Bhaji, there is a Sandhi there. Don't think life comes to an end. Don't think you will become non-functional. On the contrary, as the ego dies, earlier perhaps you are savoring, you are enjoying certain thoughts of how you are from a very well-known family or how you have certain, maybe you, in some context you, you had you, reason to feel proud and in some other context you were feeling low. That is all gone now. There is a certain inner silence but that is not end of life. On the contrary, in the absence of that ego, aham aham taya, in the form of a I, 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 there is a pure I, which Paul Brunton called Overself, Wisdom of the Overself, was the book he wrote. After meeting Ramana Maharshi, studying some of this literature, this British journalist or writer went back and wrote a book and he titled it Wisdom of the Overself. The normal self swells or sinks, swells or shrinks, I should say. But the over self remains peaceful, quiet, very loving, very understanding. And that is expressed as Sphurati, there shines forth the true I. And Maharshi is fond of calling this true I heart, hrit, heart. Hridaya. And when somebody asks, why do you call the pure self the heart, it is uh, recorded. He told somebody to go get a certain book from the library of Ramana Ashram. That was a book on Ayurveda. And in that book of Ayurveda, the word Hridaya was used in a certain context to point to the spiritual truth of one's existence. He said, it's not that I coined this. Look at that ancient Ayurvedic work. Uses the word Hridaya, heart, for the Atma Tattva. Hridaya is Atma Tattva, not the blood pumping organ. So here to Hrit, there shines forth an intuitive understanding of who we are, which is steady and Parama, it is supreme, Purna, it is complete. And Sat, it is the truth. And all along when we cried or laughed, celebrated or sang to rock bottom, all when all these things were happening, that sense of I which went up or down was a mere illusion. That was Asat. The true I was ever present, but we didn't have the eyes to see. That's the whole literature. That's how the science explains it. Therefore, summarily, this shloka just says that when the ego dies, no harm, no question of uh, damage, uh, no question of some injury, no question of losing our normalcy or naturalness. On the contrary, 
we have a certain unquestionable and unconditional security and out of that we will be doing whatever we were doing with greater love or the maximum love and so on. This is the very assuring shloka. Let me pause here and as announced we have some 20 minutes for some questions and answers. Feel free to ask any question or make a, any constructive comment. Oh. Yes. So, what is the purpose of ego? If it's really wow. you to get rid of it. Yeah. Now, ego does give you basic uh, competitive nature. Yeah. Now, you get rid of it. Mm. So, from where would you get that competitive nature? And how would you get the growth that and progress? You know, you have heard of. Uh, Eknath Ishwara. Yeah. He used to say, do not compete, complete each other. So, in human consciousness, that is your, my, her, his consciousness, there could be a certain non-competitiveness being laid back, looking left or right, having no focus, etc., etc. Compared with that, all of us appreciate, I myself read Robin Sharma's 5 a.m. club to get that competitive edge. <laughs> you know, I am after that. You know, I want to, as a speaker, writer, teacher, this, that, you know, as a human being, even I, who is otherwise so much into high spirituality, want to get up early, finish things fast and so on. So I fully uh, resonate with the sentiment you expressed. All of us you know, want to be on the go. That is highly desirable compared with a certain lack of focus, some regret pulling us down, <coughs> some distraction, somebody scaring us, don't try to do that. And we feel, compared with that, to be brave and bold and... <coughs> spirituality says there is a level above that. From non-competitive, laid-back condition, you come to competitive, uh, what that word in management, proactive uh, conduct, be proactive. You know, among the seven habits of Stephen Covey, the first one is be proactive, right? But then from compete you go to complete, meaning you are working with different people and rather than trying to be better than somebody, you want to synergize. You have personally no malice against anybody. You have, you don't derive any pleasure by being ahead of somebody per se. You, know. you derive happiness of being excellent. You, know, you work better than yesterday, let us say. That gives you happiness. Not that comparative thing. You know. That comparative thing, uh, I want to be ahead of that other person. Then there are two ways. Either I perform better or his performance should go, go down. So this human mind can go to evil tendencies. You know, somehow I want his business to fail or something. That All those distortions also take place on the, this competition. Then of course we call it unhealthy competition. In healthy competition, uh, you know, fairly noble executive or a businessman or anybody would say, I have absolutely no wish that somebody should fail. But we want to perform it. That's good, well said. So what is the purpose of ego, is how you started your question. The purpose of ego, in fact, that would not be a very valid question really. The, the, the ego is part of the world scenario as we presently see. And uh, it, it really may give these benefits of making us competitive, but it also carries with it, it entails a lot of uh, hard burn too. So the um, ego is a statement of fact, how things are, right? And uh, the more valid question it seems to me is, what is the purpose of eliminating the ego? To eliminate the ego has this purpose, that we remain active or we remain vibrant without the hard burn of I lost, he won, they were ahead, I, I was behind and so on. Because this division of others and us is the cause of much sorrow. In that sense, yeah, 
there is a purpose to try to rise above the ego and there is no purpose of ego except uh, to wake us up from tamas, from laziness, which you also nicely expressed, that it gives us a competitive edge. Yeah. When you say observation and inquiry, one. Say, one. is inquiry or actually inquiring, who am I, you know, like, why am I? And correct, that, correct. Is observation very really passive or it has to be intelligent uh, you know, analysis. Actually, in the beginning it seems to us that inquiry is about that, that kind of verbal affair. Who am I? What am I? Analyze, check out and so on. As our inquiry matures, verbosity takes a back seat. There is no verbalization. <coughs> inquiry is Seeing and that seeing itself has that questioning inbuilt into it. Just like ordinarily we think of looking at a flower uh, with a certain, certain um, 